Evangel University is my, my school. That's where I graduated from college um, I, 30 years ago this, this year. Ouch, that's so hard, to, so hard to realize. But I love my experience at Evangel. That's where I met my wife, Jeannie. And uh, my life has never been the same after that experience. In a good way, yes. I meant it totally that way. I know that there's a lot planned in this service, and I know that you're enjoying the music, but in, and I plan to share something this morning. And uh, believe it or not, in the first service, I did this in about nine minutes. It's the shortest sermon I've ever preached in my life. But we're currently in a series called Red Letters. We're looking at the words of Jesus in Scripture. And one of my prayers for us as a church is that we truly reflect the heart of God, that we grow in our passion to worship Him. I've already spent time in worship this morning, but worship isn't just singing songs. Worship isn't just giving our money. Worship isn't something that we do in church. It's not just a church service. It can be all those things, but worship is us offering our lives Everything that we have to God for his glory and for his purpose. Paul says in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice to him. This is truly the way to worship him. The red letter words of Jesus that we're looking at today is in John chapter 4 verse 23. And these are the words of Jesus. He said, a time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. See, God isn't looking for gifted public speakers or charismatic leaders or amazing musicians or those who are best looking or best dressed or who have the most Instagram followers. This scripture says that he's looking for those who are true worshipers. He's looking for true worship. Jesus also said, these are red letters, him quoting from Isaiah, addressing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. May it never be said of us. So if God is seeking true worshipers, then we should give him the worship and the honor and the glory that he is due. Psalm 100 kind of sets the tone for this. It says this, Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. So in just the few minutes that I have here, I want to share with you uh, three different qualities from scripture about true worshipers. The first one is this. True worshipers worship with awe. Hebrews 12, 28, the writer of Hebrews says, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. The word awe in Greek is the word phobos, which means reverential fear of the power and holiness of God. It describes a person reacting to some uh, astonishing work of God. Psalm 95, 6 says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. There's so many examples in scripture of people worshiping and kneeling before God in awe. Think of the wise men in Matthew chapter 2. The baby Jesus has been born in Bethlehem, laying in a manger. This says that the the wise men came, and what they did when they came, they first saw him, is that they bowed down and they worshiped him. The Bible says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When was the last time that you were in awe 
or amazed at the presence and the power of the work of God. We sang a song in the first service that says this, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I stand amazed and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. It should amaze us every day of what we would be without God's presence, without his help, without his grace and his mercy and his love and his forgiveness in our lives. True worshipers worship with awe. And the second thought is that true worshipers worship with abandon. I think of so many examples in scripture of that, but I look to the book of Daniel and there's these three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar set up an idol 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, and commanded everyone to bow before this idol and worship the idol. It was an idol of himself. Well, these three Hebrew guys decided we're not doing that. The penalty was that they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. Furious with rage because they didn't bow before the idol. The only three that didn't do this. Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image that I made, very, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And their response, they said, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't, want to defend, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. They knew that God was able, and they believed that God would do this. But, they said, even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you set up. Now, this is worshiping with abandon saying, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I'm not bound to an idol. I'm not bound to the enemy. I'm only going to bow to Christ and him alone. And I don't care who else is not doing it. I don't care who's doing it. I've determined and set my mind that no matter what, I'm going to serve God. You can imagine that infuriated him. And if you know this story, you can go read it in Daniel chapter 3. They didn't bow. He heated up the furnace seven times seven times hotter, threw him in the furnace. And if you turn to Daniel chapter 3, verse 28, this is what, oh, just a second, wrong verse. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 26, approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High, come out. Because they looked in there and saw that there wasn't just three people, there were four. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire of all things. And the, and the prefects and satraps and the governors and royal advisors all crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was not even the smell of fire on them. Because they were abandoned to say, I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to follow God and him alone. Do we follow him with that kind of abandon? That no matter what, Do we serve God because of who he is, because of what he's done? The reality is because of who God is, because of what he does, we can't help but worship him. When we come into a setting like this, there should be no reason for us to cross our hands and go, hmm, isn't that pretty? It's an opportunity for us to open our hearts wide and express our love, our gratitude, our appreciation with abandon not caring who sees us, not caring what, what it looks like. You know, sometimes you just, gotta, you just gotta shout. How many of you got a shout in you? Sometimes you just gotta clap your hands and you gotta say, you know what, there's nothing that's gonna keep me from clapping my hands. We do it, listen, there's worship all in our culture. We go to stadiums and we cheer on men in helmets, banging each other and running a little football into an end zone. And sometimes we cheer and the team like rewards us with a victory on Chiefs fans. And some of us are fans of teams that disappoint us and let us down, Dan. I'm sorry. But listen to me. 
We can go to a stadium to watch a concert. We can go to a stadium to watch a game. And we can cheer, raise our hands, shout and act crazy. And we should be able to worship our God with that kind of abandon whenever we get together, whenever we're out, wherever we are. True worshipers worship with awe. They worship with abandon. And true worshipers worship with intimacy. David said this in Psalm 27, 4, One thing I ask of the Lord, and this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. You see, the psalmist is saying here, and I, and I pray that all of us could echo this, that if I could have just one thing, this is what he's saying, if I could have just one thing, it's not power, it's not things, it's not money. If I could have one thing, it would be intimacy with God, to live in his presence. If you ask me about my wife, Jeannie, I could go on and on telling you the things that I love about her. You see, one of the things that I love about her is that she's not here this morning because she's serving in the nursery, and so I'm saying all this stuff, and it's not even any benefit to me because she can't even hear me, <laughs> unless they have the monitor on in the nursery. But I love that she has a heart to serve. I love how passionate she is about winter and cold and snow. I don't share the passion, listen to me. <laughs> but I love her, her passion for those things. I love to see how disciplined that she is. When I first met her in college, she studied all the time. I had the best semester that I ever had when I first met Jeannie because if I was gonna spend time with her, I had to go to the library. Only time I made the honor roll, the, the, the president's list at Evangel was the, sum, the semester that I met Jeannie. Her discipline, she exercised, she used to run five to 10 miles a day. Now she's got neck issues and she walks three to five miles a day. She spends time daily with God. She's a hard worker, she's organized. She's done an incredible job of our, our family of seven, making sure everybody had what they needed, that they got where they, I mean, with all the activities, the events, the sports, the games, the concerts, making sure everybody had what they needed and where they were. All of our married life, I'm here at church early. She is always, all of our married life, five children, got all the kids ready and, and to church all by herself, always. And she's always on time, and on time to her is 15 minutes early because if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. She wouldn't give herself credit. She's tough on herself, but she's done a great job as a, as a mother to our children, as a nana to our grandsons. She always makes time, takes time to do the things that need to be done. And she loves me. The first summer that, uh, that we were dating, we met at Evangel, and the first summer I went to Texas and sold books and Bibles door to door. I worked 80 hours a week, and she was in Montana with her family, and she was working a full-time job. She got another full-time job because she couldn't be outdone by me. So here we both were working 80 hours a week, and there wasn't a day when I was in Texas that I didn't get a letter in the mail or a package from her. She's dedicated. You see, I could go on and on and tell you things about Jeannie, but I don't have the time. But here's the thing. I don't have to do research on her. I didn't have to go to a class. I didn't have to Google search. I didn't have to stalk her on social media because I know her. I know her intimately. That's what God wants for us to know him that way. Not just that we know about him and know things about him, but that we grow to know him, to have intimate knowledge of his character, of his goodness, of his faithfulness, of his power. And that comes by spending time in his presence, time in his word. God is looking for worshipers, true worshipers, who will worship him in spirit and in truth, with awe, with abandon, and with intimacy. Would you bow your heads with me? Across this room, would you just open your heart to the Lord and let him speak to you today? Father, I pray that you would draw us near to you. God, we, as your followers, want to be worshipers. Not worshiping the things of this world and this culture, but worshiping you with all of our heart. Not just with our words, but with our lives, with our actions. Everything that we are, that we're all in. That we love you and know you and pursue you with all that we have. 
Jesus, I pray you'd touch your people. Reveal yourself to us. As we pursue after you, God, knowing that you pursue us. And today, if anyone is opening their heart, I know we prayed earlier in the service for those who are reaching out to Jesus. But if you just call on his name today, he'll answer you. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Save me. Forgive me. Love me. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.